Julie Taymor is a theatrical icon who just celebrated the 20th anniversary on Broadway of her smash staging of The Lion King, which is a hit on stages around the world. She's also brought David Henry Quang's Tony-winning play and Butterfly back to the boards in a stunning new staging starring Clive Owen. Here, the Tony winner talk about her inspiration behind both projects, Broadway dreams for her well-loved film Across the Universe, the man she's been happily unmarried to for over 30 years, and so much more on this week's Show People. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Paul. So great to see you. You too. Congratulations on The Lion King. Oh, thanks. I mean, another milestone, right? <laughs> 20 years. Yes. How was the event? How was the gala? How you was... weren't there you were on Sunday? I, I, I was out of town. I oh, missed God, it. I'm so sorry. It. I saw the video. Elton, Elton was there, which is exciting. Well, it reminded all of us of our first preview in Minneapolis because when the animals started down, well, first, when you get that chant. People Cidilla started, Loca? yeah. Well, no, this is not CD La Loca. Oh, right, right. I was talking about the first preview, right. yeah. Right. Oh, the first preview, yes. Both of them, two CDs. <laughs> two CDs. It was, uh, it was a rock concert. People started screaming, and you couldn't hear a thing. Same thing happened here. We had so many performers who had been in the show mm -hmm. over the 20 years. So every little moment, the ant lady on the, on the toe shoes or <laughs> the gazelle wheel, everyone was screaming for every character. And just the, the thrill and excitement of that was, was it just jolted us 20 years ago to what it was like. When you got involved with the project, was there something where you said, oh, that's a theatrical moment. Oh, I know how I'm going to pull that off on stage. A lot of people were like, how are you going to do The Lion King on stage? The thing that I thought would be the hardest thing would be the stampede. Yeah. So that was the thing that propelled me to want to do it because mm. I thought, okay, I'm going to, even though I've made films, I, I'm going to do this with absolutely rock bottom, the most old fashioned theatrical techniques that yeah. are there. So even that little that little um, uh, mouse that's right after the circle of life, that's just a little cut out of a mouse and a little <laughs> flashlight on a stick <laughs> going right. along in its own follow spot. But something like the stampede, I was reminded of the old days when they would have rollers, you know, and, yeah. and they do waves, you know, yeah. the old old fashioned um, theater that would have forced perspective. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll take these rollers and I'll put little wildebeest and then a piano roll will be behind that, will they be painted? and. Then I knew that because I was going to use masks and, and all level of puppetry, I'd play with scale. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of thing, and then you, you have it in the gazelle wheels. Yep. And I think, I think actually one of the most, for me, major decisions and, and, and sort of set the tone is the sunrise. Mm -hmm. Because 20 years ago, people were starting to get hooked into projections. Mm -hmm. Now they're ubiquitous. There are too right. much, actually. But um, I like them. I use them, but not all the time. Like an M butterfly, except for one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I thought, I'm going to do what I know is the origin of theater, which is take something that, like the stick and the silk and the wires or the threads and let the audience know that that's what it is. It's just fabric and bamboo so that when it's pulled up and it rises and they see the mechanics of it, they're, they're going to be moved in a very mm -hmm. poetic, mm -hmm. spiritual way because of its obviousness. Now mm -hmm. people would think it would be the reverse. They would think that if you show the magic or you make it apparent that it's just a bunch of fabric and sticks that mm -hmm. it would lose its depth. But it isn't that way because everything about being, about playing and about creating theater from the beginning of time is about the suspension of disbelief. Right. So, okay, I know that's not the sun, mm -hmm. but you're making me, reminding me, it's the color, it's the way the air in the room pushes the fabric. It's, it's that it becomes that circle from a mound. So that calls upon our DNA, our, mm. old, our DNA of what it is to be creative. Yeah. And I think that's the soul of the, the show on a visual level. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the beauty of the work. I guess remembering the simplicity of why theater works is always yes. important. Yes. Is that something you just sort of always have to remind yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, you know, people think, oh, I do such overly complex, or sometimes, you know, they get that. But I don't ever cr use techniques unless I feel like it's absolutely essential to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. It has to be integrated, and there's a, you know, has to have meaning in the technique meaning in the medium, mm -hmm. messages in the medium. Do you revisit your shows often? Do you I mean, and Lion King is playing all over the world. Right. 
Do you uh, drop into a, a random country and drop yeah. into the Lion King? <laughs> no. no, sometimes in London I've done that, but I, I think I'm not going to drop into China or Japan, <laughs> but usually if I... No, actually, when I last went to Japan, it was for a screening of, of, of The Tempest, of, uh -huh. a, of a movie. Yeah. And so it wasn't Disney that brought me, so I did call up the Lion King company, Shiki, <laughs> and say, I'm here. I'll come and see it, and I'll do some rehearsals, and you they got were two delighted. Two tickets on the aisle, for yeah, Julie yeah, just one I needed, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I did, and then I worked with the uh, performers because um, a lot of those people have never worked with me because right. it's been eighteen years. <laughs> Why would they have worked with me? Wow. No. What do you look for when you're watching, let's say, The Lion King, and you drop into The Lion King on Broadway? What do you What are you paying attention to? Is the story being told well? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be as simple like this afternoon. I'm giving notes to my associate director hmm, okay. for what I saw Sunday night. Okay, uh -huh. Even though it was a wonderful performance Sunday night, there were certain things like um, sentences or words that get too much overlapping mm. and words dipping off on the end. So mm -hmm. that's, that's sheer, are we getting, whether it's the story, the dialogue, or the jokes. Mm. You, you're stepping on a joke, you know. It's because people who are working on it day by day can get very used to it and they right. have to keep throwing themselves back to being virginal. I mean, it's not the easiest thing right. to do, but you have to. And s hear it with ears that have never heard it before. I'm not trying to be a dictator about it, but there are certain ideas and things that have to remain. Um, and those are the things that I'm, I'm there to remind them of. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very happy with the Broadway uh, mm -hmm. show. It's wonderful. Obviously, I, you had a great experience working with Disney yes, on I this did. project. W have you ever been tempted by any other Disney properties? Sure, yes. To bring them to the stage? Have, have we, been... we started to work on a Pinocchio years ago, which I still would be interested in. But I, I think that why we didn't really, we, there was um, um, a difference of opinion as mm -hmm. they say, uh, for how close it should be to the Disney movie version or how close it should be to the Kaladi original Disney. Right. Uh, not original Disney, excuse me, original book. Right. Um, and, and so I probably, I wanted to go more towards the Kaladi mm. and, and so we never really continued on that one. Right. But there are, other, there are other ones that I think would be fun to do. Yeah. yeah, you think that might be a possibility at some point? Like we might see another. I, it's not. It's not on the table right now, right. but that doesn't mean anything. Well, I want to talk about uh, M Butterflies. So we're going to take a quick okay. break, and we're going to talk about your beautiful new production of M Butterfly. Thank you. Okay. We'll be right back with Julie Taymor. <laughs> Back with Julie Taymor. Now, of course, The Lion King is, is continuing to play on Broadway. We'll, we'll be playing probably forever, long, you know, <laughs> until I die. I'm sure Lion King will be playing at the Minskoff Theater. But three blocks north, there's this beautiful uh, new staging of M. Butterfly, which is a play, I was telling you this earlier, is a play that I really fell in love with M. Butterfly, the original production. Mm -hmm in 1988 that John Dexter directed. Mm -hmm. Did you see that production? Yes, I did. You did? Yeah, yeah, it was a, it obviously won Best Play. It was a big... A big Eiko Ishioka designed it. And oh my God, yes. And, and similar to Julie Taymor Productions, <laughs> I can picture it in my head. Like, I, it's so mm -hmm. distinctive in my head when you see something so beautifully designed and staged, like it really sticks with you. And I'm sure the new M Butterfly will stay with me too because I thought it was also stunning. In, in a totally different way. It's not at all the original production. David Henry Huang has reworked the script, mm -hmm. and it's a totally different visual vocabulary, and I think it's beautiful. Thank so you. congratulations, and I was so excited when they announced you were doing it. I knew, I thought this is the perfect person with the perfect project, and why did you think, yes, this is something I would like to do? Well, I love David Henry Huang. I think he's a wonderful writer. I, I myself have spent many years in Asia. I, I went when I was really young, about 15 or 16, yeah. to Sri Lanka. And then years later, I, at age 21, I spent four years in Indonesia and traveled to Japan, Singapore, Thailand. And I just, I've been, and now because of Lion King, I've been to more countries. We just did a Lion yeah. King in China. Wow. So Asia, and if you know Lion King, then you know it's very inspired by my time in Asia. So Asia itself, is a place that I am, the, 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 the Asia, it's so huge, but yeah. various, various countries in uh, uh, China uh, fascinates me and I've spent time there and I feel like the, the play itself is such an incredible opportunity to fuse both Western opera, I've directed a lot mm -hmm. of opera at the yep. Met, uh, that you know Magic Flute is there now, mm -hmm. and then 
What happened is that since David wrote the play, all of this information about the true story came out yeah. post the original play. Right. And the facts of the, that real story of these two characters, of these two real people and what went on was so amazing to me. I asked David if he would be willing to relook at his play because I don't know if you know some of the story, but it's not just in the, in the original script it was we keep it a secret that this is real, this what appears to be a Chinese diva female yeah. opera singer at the end turns out to be a guy. It, and it was genuinely shocking in the original it was. production. It was all built up to this sort of shocking moment. And that's what it was about yes. more than anything. Right. And that doesn't shock today. Mm -hmm. It doesn't shock in right. any way. A lot of people know, know it. And it doesn't feel like that is the most important thing of their story. Mm -hmm. In the real story, it's a much more gender fluid, which felt so contemporary. We didn't, we didn't have to work on that. It was there, wow. inherent in the story. So our shock is really about the kind of love story. Mm. I, find, I find it equally, if not more so, shocking to see how these two people um, have to navigate being truly in love with each other in, in such an unusual situation and kind of love that cannot be named. Mm. We cannot put, you know, binary genders on 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 one of these characters. Right. And this is based on the real story. So, I find that that kind of uh, carousel or roller coaster of is he is she is mm -hmm. he a she a he a she a she. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that both societies, the Chinese during the Cultural Revolution and the French during the 1970s, which is supposed to be about freedoms and personal freedoms doesn't allow for this extraordinarily unique romantic love story to flourish. And so it's, it's David's a very comedic writer. He's got, you know, mm -hmm. there's tons of wonderful comedy, but it's an extraordinary tragedy, mm. ultimately what yeah. goes on. And there was also this other opera that David didn't know about called Butterfly Lovers that was mm -hmm. very integral to the story. So we've got much more of the Chinese point of view in mm -hmm. this version, mm -hmm. much more of Song, the character's point of view. Mm -hmm. But I also think that what David was able to do here, the other one was more political. It was really about, you know, the Asia as representing the feminine mystique, the feminine, right. inscrutable feminine. Mm. Well, right now, America's not on top. China's on top. So certain kinds of relationships between Asia and America, or the East and the West, is changed radically in 20 years. Right. So he still has his incredibly potent political um, point of view yep. in the play. But I think what I stressed for him to do, and I think that I hope think you felt this, that the individuality of these two people and their love story is much deeper than the original script, mm. than the original play. They're not just tropes. They're not just set symbols. up there to be symbols right. of East and West and male and female. Right. It's much more complex. Right. And it reminded me how great you are with actors. I mean, oh, directing actors, because it's very easy to think of Julie Taymor as just great visual. Constantly, I'm put into the box, and yet I've worked with Anthony Hopkins and yeah. Titus and Helen Mirren and Alan Cummings, and I mean, just brilliant yeah. actors. My and I love them. And you know, it's it for me. It starts with the script, the story, the writing, the actors, and mm -hmm. then the visual has to support that always. And these performances are spectacular in M. Butterfly. Clive Owen, is he someone you knew before? No, I didn't know him personally. I was so blown away by his, his work and, and the way his performance builds over, over the evening. I mean, it's really beautiful, beautiful work. What were your first meetings like with him? Very exciting because we met a year before we did the show. We were supposed to do it last spring. Mm -hmm. And Clive said he would really be interested in doing it, but he would want to spend more time preparing for it. So would we postpone to the fall? And we wow. said, yes because he didn't want to go movie to movie to movie to, or TV yeah. or whatever he's doing. So we met early. He had liked the original script, so he was hooked. Mm -hmm. But then what really got him interested was the fact that David was going to, re was going to rework it yeah. and was completely open to reworking. And Clive would come to meetings in my kitchen. We met in restaurants. We met in New York. We met in London and with David. And then we also did this really very critical workshop in the spring, one of these 29-hour workshops, and that helped, and then he kept working on it in the summer, and whenever he wanted to come to rehearsal in, in the September, he was there if we wanted him, so I mean, we had a great collaboration. You also, it's another collaboration with Elliot Goldenthal. Oh, totally. The man, <laughs> the man in your life. You, yeah. you, you guys have been together 
a long time. Over 30 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Happily unmarried, as they Happily say. unmarried. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you collaborate on basically all of your projects. I mean, for well, no, I've done I've done some dead composers in the opera, you know, <laughs> Wagner and Mozart, Stravinsky, and they're all great. And then I've done Eliot's opera Grendel, which was my favorite, to be uh -huh. honest. But uh, yes, he did the score to M Butterfly with Puccini. So you've got Puccini yeah. from Madame Butterfly. Yeah. Then Eliot literally had to write Chinese opera. Uh -huh. And we have this wonderful Chinese musician, you saw the percussionist, who does, really has to be live with the dancers. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then Eliot wrote all the other score music for it. But he's done, he's done all my movies. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of my theater, uh, obviously not Spider-Man, um, which is probably the reason. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I love working with Eliot. I met Eliot working together. We worked together five years and then it was, what? Who's that? You was know? that love at first sight for you? No. It took a while? Took five it took, years. It no. Took five years. It was, he's cute, he's cute, and I like him, but it, the thing is, it was really the working together that made us uh -huh. get, yeah. which is, which means that, you know, our relationship working is really so vital and exciting and sexy because that's how we fell in love. Are you creative soulmates? Yes, we are, totally. So, but it feels like you have all these projects you work on together. Do you guys ever just like Netflix and chill? We did last night. <laughs> what did we watch last night on Netflix? We saw an unbelievable documentary last night called One of Us about Hasidic, about oh, the Hasidic I haven't three. seen it, but I know what you're talking about. Wow, we just were doing this. I couldn't get into Filmstruck, couldn't remember my password, <laughs> didn't know I had to. So no, we do that a lot. And we travel and, you know, he works with other directors. Uh-huh. Other, so it's not all work with you guys. You, you no, no, and I've and worked with other composers, but but rarely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna take another break, and we'll be back with more Julie Taymor. <laughs> and we're back with Julie Taymor. <laughs> uh, can we talk about your childhood for a minute? Because when you okay. read about, like I was reading about your childhood on Wikipedia, as you do. And it sounds so like lofty and intimidating. And I mean, like, but before you like graduated high school, you'd been to like every. I mean, you'd been all over the world. I mean, you you had a very uh, worldly childhood, and you were you were going off. Uh, what you were eleven years old? Is that true? You were going off into Boston yes, and, yes. and doing theater, and yeah. It's it sounds kind of crazy when when you hear about it. But I think those days nobody had fear. There was no fear. Right. So I was probably, yeah, 9, 10, 11 or something, and I would take the subway, or not the subway, the, the, the T, yep. from the suburbs and go into Boston. And what was fantastic about being a part of Boston Children's Theater is that the kids came from all over. In your suburbs, you're with people who live in mm -hmm. the suburbs. But in Boston, at Boston Children's Theater, I met kids from Roxbury, South Boston, mm -hmm. you know, all r races, much more diverse, right. which I think started my, my wanderlust, you mm. know, which is to take myself out of my own comfortable environment and put myself into places that challenge me and meet people who are different than I am. Mm. So then my brother and sister are well, now you know everything because you've read Wikipedia, but they're <laughs> seven and eight years older. And, and so they, when they, you know, I watched my parents go through the 60s with them, go through uh -huh. the hell of the 60s, across the universe, the yes, movie. Which I that's talk a about. We're talk very, about very good example of what my family okay. was like because uh -huh. that's the closest thing to being a more biography, but not really, but just a little bit. Okay, interesting. And we can talk about that. But um, I, I was really really hungry to travel. So when I was about 15, I went on the experiment in international living to Ceylon, right. which is now Sri Lanka. Yeah. Traveled through South India and went to Ceylon and lived with a family. And, you know, I remember being out on the Indian Ocean and it's, it's yes, traveling and, and really going out, living in, living in other cultures, not just traveling. I don't know, my parents gave me more independence and freedom. After they went through the hell of my older brother and sister, mm. rebelliousness, the whole thing, they kind of let me alone and let me go off. And then at 16, as you know, <laughs> I went to Paris, right. graduated high school early. I had been in a theater company, experimental theater company in Boston, not children's theater, mm -hmm. adult theater. And I wanted to study mime, so I went to Paris for 
a year and studied at Ecole de Mime Jacques Lecoq. And that's not that, that I wanted to study mime, it was more understanding how to use the body, how to, mm -hmm. how to really tell, visually work with actors, but really use your body as an expressive means of, of, be, of, of creating a part. Mm -hmm. What, which of your projects do your parents love? What do you think they really like? Well, my father never got to see Lion King. Wow. So he went into the hospital the day it opened. Oh, on, wow, that's tough. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's awful. No, wow. it's not a good story. It was, uh, it was the best of times, the worst of times. Huh. And I didn't know till my mother sat down and there was an empty seat and C.D. La Loca started to sing. Oh, my God, And wow. And I said, where is he? Um, you know, my father, and she said, don't worry, he's in the hospital, but he never got out of the hospital, and he died that year, so um, it can't be the Lion King. Right. Uh, there, there were many, many shows, you know, before the Lion King yeah. that my parents, Juan Darien, you know, which mm. is yeah. something that happened right. many times, and the Green Bird, you know, there, there yeah. were shows that, that yeah, yeah. they all came to, they yeah. came to. It just seemed like they were so supportive of, of creating this woman that's in front of me. How creative you are and how worldly you are and how open you are, like you said, to people and cultures and it seems like they really fed that. They did and they treated me as an adult and I treated them as comrades. Mm. I, I don't know how come that happened. I guess it's partly because I watched them try and discipline and be, deal with the 60s and the drugs mm -hmm. and the whole thing which is again of course. Yeah. But there was a real mutual respect that my parents had for me and I had for them, which gave us um, the ability to enjoy each other's lives. When I went off to Indonesia at age 20, 21, I went for supposedly for three months and stayed four years. I came back after two, but I had harrowing adventures in Indonesia, harrowing <laughs> accidents, motorcycle, volcano, <laughs> unbelievable, started a theater company. They got it through mail, there was no internet. And one time they did come over and visit me. But again, there was just this tremendous respect, and that allowed me to flourish as a, as a young woman and not have to feel like it was out of rebellion, but it was out of real, my own, my own drive and my own sense of direction. Hmm. My mom is 96, and she just saw him Butterfly this wow. week. She came to, to New York. She keeps saying, oh, it's going to be the last time. I was like, uh-uh, no way. And she called me, and she was discussing it. And she was, she would, she, I saw the original M. Butterfly with my parents 30 years ago. I sat, this is a good one, I sat in the front of the mezzanine. I knew, it wasn't a big shock for me. I mean, you, you can't get past the opening night and not know. Right, right. Some people don't read the newspaper, right, I suppose. Right. But my mother and I knew, and my father didn't. So my mother and I, here's my father, here's my mother, we're looking over and we're watching him discover the truth about <laughs> this <Wong>. diva. Yeah. <laughs> as Gallimar is discovering as the yeah. lead character. Yeah. And my father was in Japan during the war. He's a wow. gynecologist, or was a gynecologist. <laughs> but you know, when you're in the front mezzanine, you're not close enough. I mean, you, right. you, you can really, the illusion can work. Right. We've had people in this end, Butterfly, in the first row. I remember during previews, a guy came up to me, a film producer, he came up to me in the intermission and said, oh, she's glorious, oh my God. <laughs> and that husky, beautiful voice, she's just transcended. And then at the end was a full standing <laughs> ovation, and I, I looked over to see, he was in the first row, I knew where he was, and he didn't stand. And I'm wondering, maybe he was humiliated, you know what I mean? Maybe he felt by the time he knew the truth, I'm wondering what he felt like, embarrassment, whatever. But uh, we've had a, a number of people, friends of mine, who still, wow. and I, that's a tribute to Jin Ha, because, uh, yeah, because we don't try in the show to, mimic a female. My voice is mm -hmm. low. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I right. feel like there was a way, and we don't want to do a drag queen thing. Right. So, and, the, and he is who he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's very comfortable mm -hmm. in his body. Yeah, and so I, I mentioned in our morning meeting today to, to the, the staff here that you've said across the universe, may become a stage. How many years have I said that? Musical, though? and everyone got very excited and people love this movie. I love this movie. Is this actually happening? Is this As really of last week it was. <laughs> I mean, I, it's just, you know how hard it is to keep pushing projects and keep pushing, because I don't just do the normal, you know. If we just would go straight to Broadway, it could have happened 10 years ago. Yeah. But we, we want to create it in a different kind of theater, um, a, a new kind of theater. And so 
I did have a good meeting last week. I'm not going to say with who because I don't want to jinx it, but I have <laughs> not fa How could you fall out of love with the Beatles? I don't. And mm. I also think, quite honestly, that piece, like M. Butterfly, has the love story, but it's also extremely political. And yes. it's about how young people must take responsibility, get up off of their chairs and their couches and out of their mm. iPads and out of their iPhones and, and, and take charge. And if you don't like what's happening to the world, you better change it. And I think we're in a very dangerous time as we were in the 60s. I think it's equally, if not more so, no, not more so, but what got people motivated to protest in the 60s was the draft because it was happening to them personally. Right. Well, it's going to be happening personally in one way or another, whether it's global warming or whether it's abortion or whether it's whatever your views are, freedom of speech, freedom to, you know, to, 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 to protest. Right. Uh, I think that, that this is a time again where it doesn't matter that it's set during the Vietnam War. It's, it's, it's about young people for all time across the universe and those songs transcend time. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of people who are really committed to making this happen. So hopefully within the next two years, because musicals take at least a year mm -hmm. and a half to two years, mm -hmm we will finally get to see Across the Universe on the stage. First of all, you captured the period so beautifully in that movie. What would be the biggest challenge of putting that on stage? It, I'll tell you the biggest challenge is that the movie, there are very few movie musicals that are created as a movie musical first. Right. And there were 200 scenes in that film. I mean, Vietnam, bombs, Detroit, you know, Lower East Side, all, it just, yeah. it was very, very vivid, very visual, and 5,000 extras. Well, the, the, the thing that's hard is trying to compress it into um, less scenes without, yeah. without losing the power of across the universe, of it right. being in Liverpool and being here yeah. and being on the ocean and being in swamps in Vietnam and in helicopters. So, so that's hard. I am going to change out a few songs, mm -hmm. and I'm also have to limit it to hopefully around the Lion King size, which means 20, 25 people who are dancers and singers right. and six wonderful principals, and maybe two adults or three adults who can do all the adult roles. Mm -hmm. And right. in musicals, you don't have, for the most part, you don't have stars because that, that will limit the musical. Right. So <clears throat> you have to have tremendous actor actor singers who can uh, who can do these parts and I think it's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of choreography but that's the good part we threw away a lot of choreography mm. for the movie because I mm -hmm. didn't want it to be <clears throat> I wanted it to be more real right. in the movie right. so even in something like um, a little help for my friends mm -hmm. the choreography is all around being in chairs and falling mm -hmm. over and going through it's it's a different kind of choreography, but mm -hmm. Danny Ezrelo, who did, did it, will do it again. And now we'll be able to, we have about 100 hours of stuff that we, wow. you know, we compiled, and he'll do new stuff, but it will be very exciting, like the, the bowling alley. Remember uh -huh, that? Yeah. Okay, how are you going to do that in the stage? Right. You have to create a bowling alley, but Danny and I did an opera years ago where we did, it, it was the Flying Dutchman, and we had right. um, naked men sliding across the stage on water, you know, like a slip mm -hmm. and slide with, with women in 18th century dresses and, and boats on their head moving in the other direction. This was to create the storm, so you'd see men going as right. women were moving against the wind. So we've done some pretty interesting techniques to be able uh -huh. to do the sliding down the bowling alley. Is it already playing in your head? Oh, do yeah. You, like when you walk around the streets, are you, like, are you already visualizing Across the universe, if, yes. I, if I could see inside your brain, I could already see this. You'd see an exhausted brain, yes, you would, <laughs> yes. Because I've been wanting to do it for so many years, and I still, yeah. you know, I don't know where it will open, but probably Europe somewhere, uh -huh. or, or in the Far East even, maybe. I mm. think people all over the world know the Beatles, and so it's not exactly like The Lion King in that sense, but in, in that Lion King, the story is, a, is a, a kind of fable, mythic story that really does fit anywhere. Yeah. This one, even though it's in English, people in Russia, people everywhere sang the Beatles songs and mm -hmm. know the Beatles songs. So I'm hoping. I, I hope, I'm hoping too. I yeah. can't wait. I, I think it'd be exciting. And we, you know, I could talk to you forever, but <laughs> we've run out of time. We didn't even talk about Spider-Man. How do we do an interview and not talk about Spider-Man? Very smartly so. <laughs> 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 well, Julie, thank you so much for coming by. Everyone really needs to check out M. Butterfly. It's at the Court Theater. It's a stunning production. And, of course, The Lion King playing at the Minskoff or anywhere. Anywhere, any, anywhere across the universe. 
<laughs> Very well done. Very well Thank done. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you so it really much. Was Great a to see you. Yeah. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.